I want to say hello uh, to everybody who has joined us today and thank you very much for being here. I'm Yasmin Erga. I direct the Gender and Public Policy Specialization at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs and I convene the Women and Gender in Global Affairs Network which helps to establish and strengthen connections uh, among academics engaged in teaching, research, and advocacy on issues pertaining to global affairs very broadly understood, seeking to promote resilience and also innovation. Welcome all to this webinar on the gender dimensions of the pandemic, the implications of COVID-19. I'm grateful to the Open Society Foundation for making this webinar and the work of our network possible. Let me thank, first of all, all the terrific speakers who have accepted our invitation to present today. A special welcome to our colleagues from Central Asia, Latin America, Africa, and elsewhere who are with us for the first time. We look forward to working together going forward. Thank you very much to all of the, you who have stayed awake late or gotten up early to be with us. I know exactly how that feels and I hope you will feel that it's been worthwhile. Thank you also to Michelle Bornstein, Jasgul Kochkorova, and Aijan Kamidola, who have worked tirelessly to make this webinar possible, and to SIPA's IT department for their unfailing help. If there are failures of technicality during this meeting, it will not be their fault. In the past several years, our network has been especially focused on addressing the threat to the gender academy represented by the sovereigntist and authoritarian tendencies that have arisen in so many countries. As, have been, as has been noted, for many such movements and governments, opposition to gender rights serves as a glue, allowing them to compact their coalitions of the discontent. These mobilizations have targeted the Gender Academy, leading to the closure of programs, the unemployment of scholars, the persecution of advocates, and the reversal of right-promoting policies. At the same time, it's important to stress, counter-movements have emerged, countries have embarked on democratizing or re-democratizing paths, and the Gender Academy in Global Affairs, as this webinar, amongst others, attests, has also flourished. Is COVID-19 a product of rising authoritarianism? As a medical syndrome, no. But the pandemic may have been extended by and may further extend authoritarians' grip. Public health measures taken under emergency rule may work in the service of the public good. But the temporary restriction of civil liberties can permanent, permanently alter real constitutions, tighten the margin for activism, and quash gender-based movements that can only thrive in the political open air. Sovereignist responses to the pandemic may disempower and distort the international institutions that could perform ever more essential functions. This is not just a general risk that raises questions about the effectiveness of coordinating mechanisms like the G20. Rather, there are specific ramifications from a gender perspective when global health and economic policies are undermined, calls to address escalating GBV and women's vulnerability in labor markets are sidelined, and proposals for public policies that actually center the needs of all those who are discriminated or disadvantaged in gender hierarchies are ignored. And the risks of simultaneously disempowering international humanitarian agencies and closing in on civil society organizations leave ref leaves refugees and all those who live in the Netherlands of statelessness, political dispossession, and social deprivation, of whom it's worth remembering large numbers are women and children, ever more exposed. And yet, emergencies this one perhaps included, can promote mobilizations and create opportunities for new social and political bargains, can in fact advance gender rights and social rights for all, and help us to think beyond what we have already thought 
mobilize new generations of scholars and activists. In other words, history shows that crises can become opportunities. Both risk and opportunity will be embedded in socioeconomic trends. Intersectionally inflected gender-based inequalities are already dramatically hardening and worsening because labor market, health, educational, financial, infrastructural policies and more implemented to address the pandemic fail to correct for them and thus in fact worsen them. There's no such thing as benign neglect of gender inequality. The accumulating burdens associated with unpaid care work, the skewed exposure to medical risk of a global healthcare labor force, which is approximately 70% female, and the data that we have about exposure to COVID demonstrates that that percentage translates into vulnerability to the disease even though mortality yeah. rates are skewed towards men. The dramatic lack of contraception, the negation of abortion as an essential service, and the rising mortality and morbidity associated with unintended pregnancies and with births mark the accentuation of structural discrimination against women embedded in policies that are careless, if not worse, from the perspective of gender equality. For all who are exposed to sexual harassment and gender-based violence, the depletion of services, but equally the gutting of cultures of rights cannot but make life harder now and in the longer term. And the emergencies stop to gatherings, mobilizations, and collective discourse can foster a control of politics that makes opposition and constructive participation in decision-making dif difficult. In this context, access to safe, and I underline safe, technology is ever more important, as this webinar itself shows. And yet, to whom is it available? When, how, where, and for what uses, and with what impact? These are only some of the issues of so many more that could and should be mentioned. Many different institutions and individuals are addressing the problems raised by COVID-19. We today will be focusing on two issues, governance, civil liberties, and gender rights, and the socioeconomic effects of the pandemic and of the policies devised in response. Our purpose is twofold, to lay the groundwork for an understanding of what is happening so that we may track its implications in through and for civil society and, the, and for the educational institutions that are our homes, follow its effects through the relationships between the academic world or the knowledge, the spheres of knowledge production, practitioners and advocates. All of this is essential if we are to learn and to teach in relation to what is going on today. The purpose of this webinar is to begin an exploration that can help us identify the strengths and limitations of our knowledge bases and of our conceptual frameworks, define issues for further research, and begin to reflect on how to translate what we are all experiencing into our work as educators and practitioners. I don't expect that we will come out of it. I don't think, I didn't ask, we didn't ask, for papers, we ask you for your thoughts and your contributions, and we hope that at the end of this, we'll be able to draw some um, indications for further work, not some conclusory statements. So let me now turn to our first panel, which will focus on governance, civil liberties, and gender rights. In the interest of time, I shall simply call on each speaker. Their affiliations are on the agenda that has, been, that has been posted. We ask that each speaker limit their remarks to six minutes as well as they can. To the audience, please reverse, reserve your comments for the end of each panel, but please send them to us via chat. We are not sure that there will be time for Q&A, but we will respond to your comments as soon as we are able. This event, you should all know, is being recorded. The audience mics and audios audios and visuals are disabled. 
we ask that you keep them that way to make focused uh, the focus on the speakers easier to maintain. Thank you very, very much. And with that, I'd like to turn to our first speaker, Igerim Kamidola, Legal Advocacy Officer of the Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan Feminist Initiative, Feminita. So, Igerim, to you. Yeah. Oh, thank you for the introduction and um, invitation. We are really um, delighted to share this evening with you. It's evening here. So, um, my name is uh, Igerim Kamidola, and I am as introduced a legal advocacy officer at Kazakhstan Feminist Initiative. It's a grassroots queer feminist initiative which works on monitoring, documenting and advocacy of the rights of lesbian, bisexual, queer and trans women in Kazakhstan. And, um, and today I'd like to talk as a practitioner uh, on the cases we, we've been seeing here in Kazakhstan. So, uh, yeah. Uh, can we have a next slide, please? Yeah. So before we jump in in the uh, particular cases, I'd like to give a brief in, uh, overview of the context we are having here. So uh, well, Kazakhstan is well known for the outside world that um, it's an autocratic regime with a single person rule uh, since its independence and with a poor human rights records and um, shrinking civic space and as a result relatively weak civil society and um, um, and ac activist movements so um, when we uh, when we seen uh, the state of emergency introduced uh, in the mid-march uh, as a response to the COVID-19 uh, we, we should understand that it was the first state of emergency and it fell on this felt fertile uh, soil of uh, of the state where the uh, where the state institutions have been eroding um, for the past uh, 20 30 years including representative judiciary local self-governance media civil society and alike so um, so when we saw the so when we saw the response to the covid of course we see the the problems we're facing today are actually not new, but rather an exacerbated problems we had before the mid-March, so to say. The second aspect, which is important, is that the, the national gender machinery and the policies designed by it uh, um, are exclusively uh, viewing uh, and considering women in relation to the uh, to the family and children. So when we see uh, the policies before and then during the uh, state of emergency or quarantine or lockdowns, they, um, they designed uh, with, uh, with uh, having in mind uh, a picture of woman, uh, often uh, married uh, to uh, heterosexual women in mind. So, um, thank you. Uh, can we have a next slide, please? So, when we talk about the, the impact of, um, of the COVID and then the respective state of emergency on advocacy space uh, available for, for uh, feminist movements and civil society at large, they are, in fact, uh, well, nothing but restrictive so um and um and i'd like to talk about the the, the real cases we're having today uh, uh we, so we ha we are in the state of emergency for like one month through but we already uh seen uh, a significant uh um significant impact on um fund uh, on fundamental freedoms uh, uh of in kazakhstan so for example uh, we see uh, a very active uh, seizure of, uh, of um, civic space by the, uh, by the executive and representative branches. So um, in the past month, we've seen 
to a particular uh, drug laws or amendments uh, who, which are detrimental both for civil society and gender movements. So we uh, firstly, is the, the restrictive draft law on peaceful assemblies, which was swiftly passed in the second uh, parliamentary hearing just um, and in just last week. And uh, that what this law does is actually introduces uh, higher sanctions for unauthorized public gatherings. Uh, and um, and of course, it doesn't comply with it, any of international standards and the obligations which the, the government of Kazakhstan have undertaken. The second, uh, the second uh, legislative uh, uh, reform, which is quite rushed during this uh, state of emergency, uh, uh, is uh, the amendments to the constitutional law on elections. And uh, there, there are a lot of problematic uh, aspects of this particular law, but uh, there's one thing in particular uh, regarding the, the quotas for, for women, um, which is quite concerning because there has been a mixed uh, uh, attitude by the civil society groups regarding int the introduction of quotas, but, uh, but the, the the in, but then there was a uh, there was an intention to introduce uh, there was an intention to introduce the quotas uh, um, following that uh, the, the the recommendation of uh, of the treaty bodies like CEDA on um, temporary special measures uh, and then the 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 push was to introduce quotas for women. <laughs> But uh, as uh, as it is now, the the the, <laughs> the quotas actually are now mixed because uh, the, they are now shared by women and youth. So this is, in fact, what we see is not really what what the the activists and the civil society groups have been advocated for the past uh, several years. Um, With respect to the um, the other uh, uh, the, the the courts, there's been also uh, quite a pushback because there's um, when we talk about the the, the pre state emergency uh, situation in Kazakhstan, there, there has been quite limited space for civil society and activist groups to engage with uh, state authorities but instead in case of in the situation of the state of emergency and strict lockdowns both in capital and in Almaty where the, the biggest civil society groups are concentrated there is uh, effectively no um, no space uh, for the civil society to interact with the uh, state authorities. So for example, in the aftermath of the Women's March, there was a show trial by uh, on, uh, two uh, feminist and queer feminist activists, uh, which charged them uh, of a petty hooliganism for uh, organizing a peaceful assembly without uh, a state authorization. But were we seen um, that if we saw, if the the, the hearing of the court of first instance was a public before the introduction of the state of emergency. And there was quite a, a support from the activists and the civil society groups in, because they physically could participate in the hearing and also for the journalists to cover the, the news. Uh, in the state of emergency, when um, the courts transferred to the to the online hearing was quite problematic because even though the, the, the court hearings were open, uh, it was only for the for the for the actors and their lawyers to were allowed for, to the online courtroom and uh, it quite limited the space for um, 
supporters and also media to cover um, to cover the case. So, um, you know, to sum up, what we see, uh, it's been just one one month of a state of emergency response to uh, in response to COVID, but we see a tremendous uh, effect for the for the feminist activist groups and also civil society groups in large. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Iger. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that we have such tight restrictions on time, but there's nothing we can do, but that gives us exactly the depressing portrait that I think we, we all fear is going to be characteristic of this um, pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. So next, Sinat Sultanalieva um, from the University of Tsukuba. Sinat. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you everyone for uh, coming here uh, and for also for uh, inviting me. Uh, thanks a lot to uh, the SIPA. Um, I'm gonna time myself so that I don't take um, more than the six minutes. <laughs> uh, could we see the next slide? I think mine is after this one. Um, so while we're getting the slides, I could introduce myself pretty quickly. Um, my name is Sinat Sultanaliva, and I am a um, young and upcoming um, academic, hopefully scholar uh, from Kyrgyzstan. Um, I'm a PhD candidate uh, and I'm based in Japan at the University of Tsukuba. Uh, so uh, coming from Kyrgyzstan, I was engaged um, in um, LGBT activism in Kyrgyzstan as part as member of uh, LGBT organization libraries. Um, also as a, um, one of the co-founders of the Bishkek Feminist Initiative in uh, Kyrgyzstan. And I'm also um, sort of, uh, you know, somehow engaged with the Kazakhstan Feminist uh, Initiative uh, Feminita, uh, which I Grim was uh, just presenting about. So um, we have some uh, entanglements in Central Asia. <laughs> Um, so, uh, in uh, my very brief uh, sort of a presentation, um, uh, I would just like to talk about, um, sort of share some ideas about what we might be seeing. And um, I'm pretty sure many of you have already maybe read articles uh, which kind of touch on these issues. And many of you have maybe already even started um, writing um, your own articles or papers, or um, maybe there'll be even more dissertations actually, I guess, in 2021, uh, probably. Uh, but it's the issue of uh, uh, the rise of the new Leviathan um, as we might um, kind of dramatically call it uh, right now. Um, and um, by calling it the, the Leviath, uh, Leviathan, I, I guess I don't have to go into the details of what we mean by this, um, as it's sort of a, from a classics uh, in the um, academia from international relations, I guess, or political science. Um, um, but um, I guess uh, what we are seeing and why, uh, like the reasons why we are calling this uh, uh, the phenomenon um, of uh, responding to the COVID-19 um, as the, uh, the rise of the new Leviathan um, is very much related to the biopolitics um, of uh, the COVID-19 response. Um, and um, um, uh, as an academic, as a scholar, especially also not a very experienced scholar so far, I find it actually quite exciting um, that we are seeing in uh, real life, uh, in real time, sort of how the po biopolitics are actually, um, you know, being rolled out and we can trace them and we can just, you know, sit back all quarantined in our houses um, and just analyze the things that are happening. Um, and specifically by, by politics, I guess, um, we know how the states are right now um, sort of uh, having such direct access to uh, very intimate details of our bodies or bodily autonomy and functioning, like uh, checking our body temperatures uh, when entering uh, different buildings or when outside even. Um, our mobility is being uh, tracked uh, via um, the smartphones, via GPS. Um, in some countries, we have the QR codes, and that's um, a separate issue that's um, uh, very uh, tragic, I guess, because a lot of the 
um, um, uh, elder maybe uh, generations, especially in the post-Soviet uh, space, uh, may not even know how to use the QR codes, for example, right, or how to uh, turn on the GPS and, and other issues. Um, so uh, the, the, the biopolitics of COVID-19 is kind of uh, one of, it's the main reason, of course, of uh, uh, thinking and being worried about the rise of the new Leviathan. But another um, issue that is, that is also rising um, and is becoming very apparent is the gendered aspect um, of the resistance or uh, struggle uh, uh, with the COVID-19. Uh, and by uh, the gendered aspects, um, uh, we all, I would think, uh, agree that um, this has shown that um, women are actually at the forefront um, of the resistance of preventing of uh, attempts to cure uh, or to treat uh, the uh, uh, virus. And um, I cannot say this uh, for the rest of the world, but specifically in the post-Soviet states and in Central Asia as well, uh, women are the major majority of the workforce um, engaged in the healthcare um, and in care in general sort of um, uh, labor. Uh, so women are the ones who are um, at the forefront of uh, the battle, uh, so to speak. Um, we're also seeing this um, as a failure of neoliberalism. Uh, there is a lot of um, analysis um, on this as well, um, which is basically engendering this the rise of the strong state. Um, and by the strong state, we mean a state that's um, very much uh, engaged uh, in the lives of its citizens, but not only that, but um, also economically, um, um, sort of um, intervening economically uh, into the uh, uh, the market, into the businesses, into, um, you know, the everyday functioning of um, uh, organizations. Um, I think I'm going to go to the next slide, although we can talk a lot about that here. Um, but I think the other, um, the more important part of this uh, issue is uh, to think together uh, uh, about ideas, um, how to pivot uh, to a more just society. And I also believe, um, maybe idealistically, that uh, this, uh, this is a perfect time for us uh, to uh, think of ways uh, where we can actually push for this pivot. Um, and some of the ideas is probably stop uh, timer, last 30 seconds, I'll just finish up. <laughs> so getting the reproductive and care labor out of the private domains, where we usually think that, oh, well, you know, taking care of, of the elderly, of the sick is uh, mostly, um, should be done at home, women, wives, mothers, uh, or sisters, that's their business. Um, another thing is, uh, again, relating to the Leviathan, the rise of the Leviathan, um, maybe it is also a possibility for us to renew the social contract if we cannot get rid of the government and the states, and if the states are willing, uh, are basically desiring to become stronger and stronger, then maybe it is also up to us to renew the social contract, which we, let's be honest, we never actually signed, um, and it's a theoretical social contract, but maybe now we can make it a reality and uh, actually create a certain kind of a uh, social contract. Um, and just the last thing to throw out in, into the, you know, the, um, the noosphere, uh, maybe is it also the time to delink from the coloniality of being, um, so I'm uh, adding here some uh, decolonial, decolonial um, uh, theory into the uh, mixture, um, uh, because coloniality of being, we could say, is one of the, is the major sort of um, uh, thing that brought us here into the situation where we have the global pandemic um, that spreads basically from one uh, geographical locale and could have stayed there. Um, but uh, because of the neoliberal sort of uh, market, uh, ca global capitalism, we see, we saw the spread of this virus in such quick, um, you know, in such really, really uh, quick time, right? Basically in two months, uh, we saw it not just in China, but the rest of the world. Um, so I think I'll stop here. I took maybe two more minutes, actually. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. And I, I really appreciate the attempt to set us also thinking on uh, new issues or issues in new frames. Our next speaker is Anne-Marie Goetz, clinical professor at the Center for Global Affairs uh, of New York University. Anne-Marie. Anne -Marie? I'm waiting. Hi, sorry. I'm waiting for my video and um, to start. Can you hear me at least? Great. Yes. 
Can't see and um, I'm also waiting for my um, PowerPoint to load up. Um, I don't have control over my video, so I'm waiting for um, maybe Jessica can put it up. Jessica, could you um, could you open Anne Marie's video? Um, okay, I still can't see my PowerPoint. I think there you are. I no, can that's the wrong I, PowerPoint, though, that I see. That's not my PowerPoint, but um, Jasgul, should I just try to share my screen? Is that easier? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll give that a go. Um, I apologize. Okay. I'm there not yet completely adept at this. It's here. Um, Okay, good. Yeah, uh, I can't get rid of the side panel, but for in the interest of time, I will race on. Oh, hang on a second. I can do it. I can do it. Okay. So I was asked actually to focus on the um, multilateral, uh, the implications of the crisis for gender pursuing women's rights in the multilateral domain or via global governance. And um, I'm going to just race in because time is so short. Um, let me just keep track of that. Okay, so um, uh, really what the, uh, what the sort of huge struggle uh, is about is to what extent is this pandemic going to reinforce the sovereigntist tendencies that Yasmin referred to at the start and the misogyny and homophobia that comes with it as well as the risk of totalitarianism and social control um, versus to what uh, extent is this perhaps an opportunity to um, open the door to a truly transformational um, uh, as the last speaker said, a truly transformational understanding of social relations, the division between public and private, the meaning of essential work, etc. Um, multilateralism has uh, always been relied on as crucial for transformation in social relations by uh, feminist movements, um, although it has terrific limitations. And I think one of the first really striking things about this crisis is that the UN has been extremely uneven, missing in action, in particular the Security Council. It's shocking, uh, literally shocking, that it only met um, last week. Um, of course, um, Trump, I'm getting, I'm getting cross sound. Should I carry on? Okay. Um, Trump's announcement two days ago that he's cutting funding to WHO is unbelievable, although I suppose one should not make anything unbelievable in relation to his regime of the uh, lack of faith by populist leaders and authoritarian leaders um, in multilateralism. But, you know, there has to be also said that WHO's response to the crisis did reflect the huge drawbacks of uh, multilateral institutions that are not independent of member states that are constantly juggling between the political demands of member states and uh, the needs in this case of science. Regional institutions have been disappointing as well. Um, Italians and Portuguese have been shocked by uh, the EU's response to their needs and the um, reluctance and, and uh, slow response to Italy's huge urgent uh, need for personal protective equipment initially in its crisis. Okay, so um, we know that um, isolationism, neo-nationalism, neo ethno-nationalism has undermined multilateralism for some time, especially since the events of 2016. Um, and we've also seen that the pandemic introduces contradictory dynamics. Um, that uh, countries immediately are closing borders and shutting down and isolating in order to control the spread. Um, and this both, both seems to empower um, and acknowledge uh, nationalism and xenophobia. Um, and at the same time, by shutting borders and hoarding and um, uh, inward focus, a lot of countries have found it harder to respond, harder to source the personal protective equipment and the medical um, uh, resources that they need and a looming crisis, of course, are the interruptions in the food supply chain, which have also been caused by shutting of borders. Um, it's obvious that multilateralism is needed for an immediate response at many, many levels. Um, uh, there's obvious kind of um, immediate practical reasons why multilateralism is needed to ensure consistency of response and to prevent any single country or region from responding in ways that are going to hurt others. 
Um, but also some of the things that we can see happening are um, opportunistic exploitation of military openings provided by um, the pandemic. In other words, weaponizing the virus to hurt uh, enemy populations. And I'm afraid that's definitely happening in Syria and in Libya. Multilateral institutions are needed to intervene and stop that. Um, human rights abuses, of course, uh, flourish behind walls. And we've seen all across the world that behind the walls of the home, there's been this uh, pandemic or this shadow pandemic, as the UN calls it, of domestic violence. And then, of course, multilateralism is needed to stop uh, um, uh, ethno-nationalist leaders from politicizing coronavirus into new culture wars. Um, it's already been mentioned that there's authoritarian and illiberal responses and the distortion of emergency powers um, to, uh, to prosecute other kinds of agendas, other political agendas domestically. Um, the use of the military, which hasn't been mentioned yet, to enforce emergency measures has very serious uh, gendered consequences. Um, uh, and then, you know, in terms of women's rights and activism, um, these are things that have to be tackled domestically and internationally. But um, there is a real risk that emergency members measures will be distorted to enhance the control of women's rights and physical movement. We've seen the use of digital technology in places like Saudi Arabia. The, you may remember about a year ago, the use of the app Absher to stop women from leaving the country and to tell their male family members where they are. Um, and so there's a risk of controlling individual women. And of course, there's a risk of permanent controls on women's rights activism. So all of this is happening at a moment when um, multilateralism and gender um, issues had been a major focus for transnational women's movements because this is the year of Beijing plus 25 and the 25th anniversary of 1325. Um, uh, and so there had been a, um, an expectation that the um, this international approach been or that has been organized by UN Women, France, Mexico, and women's civil society, feminist civil society, could perhaps generate um, some action on uh, women's rights. Although that's another conversation. Um, there's limits to how far that could go as well, because it was very much focused on high optics publicity events as opposed to true multilateral negotiation. Um, the UN, uh, at least, has not really been um, uh, able to do much on the immediate kind of top line crisis uh, caused by the pandemic, which is domestic violence. Um, there have been plenty of warnings and everybody knew this was going to happen. But when it comes to uh, lockdowns, um, it turns out that nobody had solutions at the ready for preventing domestic violence in this kind of situation. There aren't enough shelters for people to go to. The, the reporting mechanisms for domestic violence nationally are telephones. Men take those out of women's hands when they're all locked at home. So um, very serious uh, set of uh, problems that we need multilateral solutions for and national solutions for in relation to domestic violence. Um, Women's civil society activism, of course, has been uh, mentioned uh, by our two previous speakers. Um, and obviously the first, the first impact of the lockdowns and so on has been the dampening of civil society activism everywhere because of the constraints on public protests. And that's really significant for women because since 2017, there have been major um, uh, important protest movements, pro-democracy movements, anti-corruption movements led by women the world over. Um, and so there is a, a disruption of this wave of activism that I think is going to be temporary. Um, and we're going to be able to, we're going to see, for example, right now in Poland, uh, women are thinking about how to uh, protest the proposed constraints to abortion that were introduced last week. Um, but there are other things to be concerned about, the diversion of funding away from women's activism um, and so on. So um, I'll stop there because my time is out. Thank you. Can't hear. I'm sorry, Professor, we can't hear you. Can you please turn on your microphone? Okay, thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, I really appreciate both your willingness to step in and provide this overview of 
of what's happening at the most, at the very essential multilateral level. And also, I apologize, but for the time constraints. Um, so our next speaker is Elizabeth Pruvel, Professor of International Relations and Director of the Gender Center at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. Elizabeth? Thank you very, very much, Yasmin, and uh, uh, thanks also to the speakers that uh, came before me. I find that absolutely fascinating, and uh, even though I feel like I, I haven't really much to say because we haven't really done much research on this uh, uh, epidemic yet, uh, it's, it's just really inspiring and interesting to hear um, the thinking that is going on. Um, I was going to uh, speak about militarization in the context uh, of this uh, pandemic. Um, I'm, I was struck uh, from the very beginning uh, about the way in which uh, people were uh, talking about waging war on uh, a virus, um, how we, we saw um, leaders uh, coming together in situation rooms, uh, pre briefing ourselves uh, as if this were some kind of a war situation. And it's indeed the language precisely that we are using to describe uh, the pandemic. And, and as this kind of was vaguely something that I felt uncomfortable about, I came across uh, um, a blog written by Cynthia Enlow on the World for website in which she said waging war against the virus is not what we need to be doing. Um, and so I'm trying to build on Cynthia's thinking there a little bit, which is of course something that she does uh, fabulously and I won't be able to approximate in any way. But I think that the idea of looking at militarization and the, and the, and the dangers of militarization uh, are really, really uh, important in this context. And uh, Cynthia tells us that militarization, by which she means embracing uh, military values such as hierarchy, obedience, secrecy, uh, and, uh, and employing these in, uh, in all areas of society, is, is pernicious because mil the military, militarization are just so centrally uh, implicated in patriarchy and built on patriarchy, uh, indeed. Uh, militarization builds on gender relations, it needs gender relations, it has at its, at its core the notion of the relationship between a protector and a protected, and so it has been uh, tightly uh, implicated with uh, uh, forces such as sexism, racism, homophobia, autocracy, xenophobia, the whole thing. Um, so when I look at what is going on with the pandemic today, I see a sense of exceptionalism, a sense of stepping out of normal politics, situation rooms, crisis communication, militarized language. We need to fight COVID, we need to wage war on COVID. There has also been a celebration of heroes and heroines. Uh, in Europe in particular, uh, the Italians started this and uh, originally I was uh, thinking this was actually kind of cute of people singing together from their balconies in order to celebrate the heroes that uh, are working in the hospitals. And they were singing the national anthem. So this is actually, been perpetuated now and we just had a sing-along uh, this weekend uh, in our neighborhood. But it's very much about coming together as a nation, pulling together as the home front, uh, showing that we are part of the struggle and the, and the fight. And so the, there's a certain uh, level of discomfort that arises in me when I'm watching this. We also see the military crucially involved uh, in the fight against uh, the um, pandemic. Uh, the USNS Comfort in, in New York is to me a, a striking image of, uh, of the military coming in with, a, with, with, a, with this huge ship that sits there uh, powerfully and seems to be that thing that is now coming to the rescue of New York. National Guard troops are mobilized uh, in the US, they're securing testing sites, they're staffing food banks. Uh, we have the Defense Production Act, 
uh, operative uh, in Switzerland, military recruits are staffing uh, the hospitals. In Italy, soldiers are uh, patrolling St. Mark's Square. Poland and Germany also activated troops to patrol streets, disinfect hospitals, support border controls, and so on. So we really, uh, in a striking way, draw on the military uh, in order to uh, co combat uh, this pandemic. So, I mean, you might say, well, what's the problem with that? Why should that be a problem? After all, they're coming in, they're helping out, they're doing all those good things. But I think we need to ask ourselves precisely what is actually the problem made out to be, if I can uh, talk with Carol Bacci here, when, when we are saying that the solution is the military. What is actually what kind of a solution? What kind of solutions are being shaped if we think of the virus as the enemy? If we think of the pandemic as something that is requiring war, something that needs to be battled? And I think we have seen uh, reactions that precisely take this framing on in an unreflected way. The fact that borders are being closed, as Anne Marie. Uh, has outlined as, as well. The way we think about the, the virus is foreign, as somehow maybe Chinese, but maybe actually from all over the place. And everybody has their own foreigners. In Switzerland, it was the Northern Italians that were the problem. And the people going skiing in Northern Italy, and so that border needed to be closed. Um, we have mounting uh, stories about discrimination uh, against uh, Chinese in particular here in, in Europe, which are really, really pernicious and pretty ugly stuff, including uh, at my university, we had this big blah just last week of uh, 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 social media uh, abuse against uh, Chinese students. Uh, parallel with that, and I think it is related, is the spike in domestic violence. The, because we know the way in which um, uh, in which uh, that is related to war uh, to begin with, but also seeing the way uh, in which the solution, the lockdown was seen as a solution, uh, uh, an unproblematic one in a way, without uh, putting a gender lens on and, and saying what kind of effects will this uh, kind of a policy produce. And so you had the spikes of violence and extensive reports from France to Lebanon to China um, on uh, that phenomenon. And then uh, people already talked about um, uh, the limiting of civil liberties, the attack on abortion, I think needs to be one thing that needs to be added to that. So I think the problem, the problem with the framing, the militaristic framing of the pandemic is that it ultimately actually, it shapes our solutions, but it also limits our imagination, our imagination of what, uh, what could be done differently. Uh, we're, we're kind of looking for hierarchies, for somebody to tell us from the top down. Uh, and we are obeying. And, and incidentally, uh, I'm asking myself, and this is more of a question rather than an, an answer of sorts. I'm, I'm really struck actually by the parallels between the military and, and public health and the similarity in, in language that is being used there. Um, the military often uses uh, medical language. Uh, we know that, you know, they talk about surgical strikes and taking out the virus of uh, terrorism and things of that nature. But we now also have public health uh, community taking on this very, very militarized language. And we have troops becoming nurses and nurses becoming soldiers. So there is a, a commingling of a certain logic going on here that uh, I think needs to be uh, more carefully um, interrogated. Um, and we're trusting in a way um, the military to come to the rescue. So, so that in itself to me is really striking because the military actually does have tools to fight this and it's not the weapons. It is actually the military, in, uh, the, the health infrastructure that they have, which I find absolutely striking. So, and we need, and that should surprise us, right? We, sh we should not just take that as for granted. That should surprise us 
that that when health system are crumbling all over, when emergency interventions are barely able to do things, the military can come in. And of course, if you have a 1.3 trillion defense budget in the United States, uh, that can provide that infrastructure. We shouldn't take that for granted and applaud the solution as much as it is needed. We also need to problematize why that is the case. And so um, I think we really need to start thinking about health systems and poverty and disadvantage rather than one-shot militarized solutions. We need to think about um, our intrinsic vulnerabilities and our mutual dependence in a sense as a starting point for, for organizing societies and maybe reorganizing societies uh, from a feminist perspective, rather than uh, being focused on uh, an enemy, uh, whether that's a virus or another. And I'll thank stop you here. so thank much, you. Elizabeth. I'm sorry to cut you off, but thank you very, very much. That was terrific. Um, our next speaker is Margaret Wanjiku Nagunjiri. Okay. Margaret? Thank you. That, 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 thank you. And uh, it was very interesting to hear, uh, listen to everybody else, very inspiring uh, uh, experiences and perspectives on what we are discussing today. My name is Margaret Wanjiku. Uh, I, I live and work in Kenya, Nairobi, Kenya. And I worked previously for the Columbia Global Center here in Nairobi. So quickly jumping in, uh, I don't have a formal presentation, but I wanted to draw our attention to some of the practical things that we are seeing here. Uh, some of them are pretty much uh, similar to what is happening in the rest of the world, uh, like the increased um, sexual and gender-based violence, uh, particularly among children. One of the things that happened, for example, here in Kenya, was that uh, immediately the lockdown began, uh, the court, the judicial system closed down, you know. So the courts were closed and, you know, the lawyers were not working, only the police, um, uh, you know, were, were, were open. The police stations were open. So one of the things that happened were, was that there was, there was an increase in the reported cases of gender-based violence happening. And, and what I wanted us to take note of is the increased, uh, uh, I guess, let me say, over, uh, increased surveillance, let me say that, <clears throat> by women's organizations that quickly collected the data that is being of, of the cases reported to police stations and used this to formulate advocacy messages, you know, that then have led, presently, have led to the opening of the courts. So as we speak, uh, the courts are going to be opened in a few days' time so that at least the judicial system can be restored. And this will hopefully also reduce uh, this negative impact on sex, uh, sexual and gender-based violence. The other issues like... Uh, the, the gender differentiated impacts on the frontline workers, particularly the nurses who are mainly female, uh, they are mainly women, uh, and this has led to separation of families. So that, that, that again has happened in a big way. There is of course the increase in the care work burden uh, uh, among women, particularly those who are working at home. And so the increased care work, because you, you have the children at home as well. Uh, and, and so this impacts also on the, the, the work deliverables. That, that, that we do. But uh, as Elizabeth has mentioned about the xenophobic attacks, uh, speaking from an African perspective also, we've seen a lot of this, and I think it has been reported in the international media, xenophobic attacks on Africans in China. Uh, you know, so, so, so these have, of course, concerned uh, the policymakers on this side. But there's also the feeling of uh, the, also the reversal in the disease burden. As, as you all might know, uh, we, we, Africa has always I think carried the heavier burden of disease. Uh, but this time we are seeing it the other way around. We have fewer cases of, uh, of, of the COVID-19. Probably we are not celebrating yet because we know that uh, we are probably still on the, the, the climbing of the curve. Uh, we hope it remains the way it is, but as you, you, you would know, we have a, 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 a lesser burden of the COVID-19 uh, here. So these are some interesting insights, but what I wanted uh, us to think about in my brief presentation is the parallel uh, surveillance and quick data collection and using things quickly to formulate advocacy messages that can then uh, inform and alter the policy decisions being made. So the 
courts have been opened, the judicial system has been opened again because of the work of gender activism. Uh, the, the, some of the impacts of loss of income uh, for particularly women uh, who own a daily wage uh, and how this is impacting families has, has also been collated and used to present to policymakers. And this has led to a presidential decree to provide uh, 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 a subsidy uh, for, for poor families. So I, I, I wanted us to look at some of these. And so I'm looking at this from, uh, less from an academic perspective, but more from a uh, practitioner, a, a gender activism perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I apologize for one of our dogs in the background. Um, I'm really sorry. But, uh, but thank you. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate also the practitioner's perspective. Our next speaker is Marilisa D'Amico from the University of Rome, Professor of Constitutional Law and Vice Rector for Equality of the University of, sorry, the University of Milan. Milan, yeah. <laughs> my, my fault. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm waiting for my, for my one PowerPoint, just one, just a summary for you. Okay, okay. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Jasmine, for the invitation. This seminar is certainly very appropriate in these times of crisis we are experiencing all over the globe. In my speech, I'll focus in on two main topics, the sources of law to regulate emergency under the Italian Constitution and the impact of these measures on human rights and on discrimination. The Italian Constitution does not specifically address the state of emergency, but under Article 78 establishes that the Parliament can approve the state of war in order to provide the government with, with the necessary power. Article 77, on the other hand, provides that in cases of exception or urgency, the government might enact decrees that have to be converted into laws within 60 days from their enactment. The situation we are living in is featured by a profound anomaly in terms of sources of law. The state of emergency <laughs> has been de declared by the government last January, and the parliament has only recently been involved. We witnessed the resort to primary sources of law to regulate situations whose substance, substance is nevertheless provided by secondary sources of law so-called ministerial decrees that are often not coherent with measures enacted at a regional level. The parliament, as, it, as, I, as I told before, is absent and does not exercise its sub supervisory functions. This is a lack of democracy, in my opinion. In this situation, there are limitations to the, to the principle of equality from the perspective of formal and substantial equality. The virus is impacting equally on everyone with no distinctions. It nullifies, nullifies the social distances and as a consequence, the enacted measures are generally and apply to everyone indifferently. From a general perspective, we should focus on the balance between, between the collective and individual health on the one hand and individual liberties on the other. But Italian Constitutional Court's case law on emergency states that this kind of measures must be temporary. As time goes by in Italy, it would be even more necessary a reasonable justification not only based on data, but also with a specific reference to all the preventive measures that we all will be required to comply with. I'm going to conclude, and my last point um, is on uh, the emergency on uh, right, and we should focus on the neglected rights of those who are already discriminated. Especially if we want to intervene on a normative level, it is not possible to isolate single factors of discrimination, because if coexistent in the, in the single human being, discriminations tend to multiply. More specifically, we can question whether, in theory, one be necessary to take into consideration the impact on the fundamental rights of those who already suffer from discrimination, 
I'm referring to women, foreigners, de detainees, disabled people, older people. What's more, more women uh, with disabilities, foreigners with different religion. A significant impact is on women in a variety of fields. One has to do with family relations and domestic violence. The current situation of emergency is paradoxically threatening two elements behind domestic violence. The isolation of women in their family and social relations, in the work environment, in the society, and men control over women's actions and choices. This forced and, and uninterrupted cohabitation, which is lasting for a month or even more, is badly affecting women, contributing to generate stress, impotence, and increasing women's work of care. Secondly, several issues deal with the voluntary termination of pregnancy. In Italy, it is becoming extremely difficult to have access to abortion, as many clinics are now closed, with a serious impact on women's rights to self-determination in reproductive choices. The third perspective deals with women's status in employment, where women are usually subjected to weaker working conditions. The post-COVID-19 emergency is likely to endanger women's ability to conciliate work and family life, especially in case schools will be kept closed or in case of a new pandemic. Lastly, there are also other important effects on women within the society, because of their general underrepresentation in the de decision making bodies. We are dealing with an emergency crisis that is mainly led by men with a series of enacted measures that are having and will have a dramatic impact on women. In conclusion, from my point of view, the limitation of fundamental rights exponentially impacts on personal on persons who are already victims of discrimination or who find themselves under a condition of deprivation of rights, like detainees. It is important that we take this impact into account in times of limitation of fundamental liberties and in times of a hopefully near future of a re-expansion of our constitutional rights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marie-Lisa. Um, I really appreciate your intervention. Next, we'll go to Lina Quillar. Uh, who is the co-founder and director of Sentinel in Colombia. And I apologize, I think there's a typo on the agenda, which is Colombia. I, I don't mistake our university, my university for your country. I, I apologize for that. Um, thank you so much. I want to thank you, Professor Ergas, and the Women and Gender Global Affairs for the um, uh, invitation. Uh, during this long and tragic pandemic, women are facing several challenges that, as most of you have mentioned, are related not only to health, inequality, and lack of opportunities, but also to the effectiveness of laws and temporal measures to prevent the massive spread of the virus. Lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and queer women in general face new challenges as well, depending on their family status. Girls and adolescents who are not out of the closet or who are amidst the recognition process face the fear of being rejected by their own family members, are experiencing difficulties such as silence, are forced to adapt their gender expression to blend in between the rest of their siblings or other family members, and face psychological and physical abuse and violence. In the past weeks, Panama, Peru, and two cities in Colombia, where I come from, adopted a gender-based mobility restriction to reinforce the need of people staying at home. LGBT NGOs denounced the risk of this restriction, uh, re, sorry, denounced the risk this restriction represents for trans and non-binary people, taking into account the police abuse against this population in the past. Moreover, this gender-based policing is passed 
to civilians who feel free to tell others if they are allowed to be out of home based on what they perceive a woman or a man looks like, uh, gender bias, stereotypes, prejudices, etc. To the difficult question Professor Ergas suggests me for this presentation, which is, is it possible to renegotiate and strengthen SOGI or LGBTQ rights? My answer, Professor, is yes, but maybe the bigger opportunity here is to promote a cultural change. And here I follow uh, Margaret Wanjiku, who, uh, who uh, told us about these advocacy messages uh, in Kenya. So, as I mentioned, with the gender-based restriction adopted in Panama, Peru, and two other cities in Colombia, the trans movement is showing how these measures, this measure is violent against trans men and women and non-binary people. In the case of Peru, for example, the restriction lasted only for one week, even though it reduced mobility in the cities up to uh, uh, 93%. Why? Because police abuse happened uh, again against trans women, for example, one day forcing a group of them to say out loud in the middle of the street, I want to be a man. One opportunity that arises from this uh, terrible situation is that a group of Congress people in Peru are seeking to pass a gender identity law due to the necessity of an official protection for trans people. In the case of the cultural change, LGBTQ organizations are using social media and digital opportunities to help queer people. One example, one creative example of this is hashtag Queerantine. The hashtag invites people to show how a quarantine for a queer person looks like. It might seem somehow superficial, but it sends a powerful message. I am myself always, even during isolation and social distancing. The Museum of Social Diversity in Sao Paulo, Brazil, is working on a digital exhibition on the topic Queerantine, calling for queer Brazilian artists to participate. In Sentido, the organization I co-founded and lead we promoted dialogue based on religion and sexual orientation and gender expressions and identities during Holy Week, last week. We interviewed religious and spiritual leaders who promote LGBTQ inclusion among their communities. And this gave our readers and audiences new perspectives and resources for their family discussions and other ways of communicating their concerns and challenges between their faith and their identity during quarantine. It's not easy to find opportunities in such a difficult situation like this, but civil society organizations have the chance to promote social change and give people new resources and opportunities to understand what sexual orientation and gender expression and identities mean. Digital resources and social media are more useful now than ever to approach young LGBTQ people who need resources and examples on how is it possible for people like them to live an acceptance process through the COVID crisis. Thank you so much. Lina, it's very interesting. And I think that you, um, that your focus on the cultural change and the initiatives that are promoting it is really important to think of the crisis as an opportunity for cultural change and to magnify cultural changes that are perhaps also already ongoing. So our last speaker of this panel is Jackie Steele from Sophia University and Enjoy VNI Consulting. Jackie. Great. And it is uh, wonderful to be with you today and to be invited to this panel. I wish to thank Yasmin and also Jazz School uh, for extending uh, and thinking of us in Japan. Um, so yes, I have recently, in fact, just in March, uh, left my position at the Graduate Law School in Nagoya University in favor of carving out more time to focus on international collaboration and feminist intersectional policy. Um, and in so doing, um, I've founded a, a consulting company around advancing feminist intersectional diversity for both uh, Japanese public policy and also um, corporations in Japan. 
So I want to go back and just talk about the last 20 years, perhaps, of what um, the work I've been working on around feminist intersectional uh, diversity, around feminist theories of citizenship, and how that's sort of correlated and intersected with the last nine years um, of research on the post-disaster uh, context in Japan, and particularly in the follow-up of the triple disaster of 2011. Um, what has been interesting, I think, is uh, we've seen not only the importance, uh, I think the first piece of the work that I was doing was around uh, power sharing and the democratization and diversification of democratic institutions and parliaments uh, with a focus on Canada and Japan, but also looking cross-nationally. And we've seen various gaps that uh, have played out within the Japanese context, in particular, since the 2011 triple disaster in Japan with the tsunami, the earthquake, uh, the earthquake tsunami, and of course, the nuclear disaster. So what have these issues brought to bear? Um, when we think about um, how we, we approach uh, risk governance or disaster, what we call disaster risk reduction in Japan, We've seen, in some ways, the literature on disaster studies, uh, the literature on disaster risk reduction, the multilateral approaches in terms of international law around disaster risk reduction have certain core assumptions that aren't necessarily always informed by rigorous feminist political theories and or feminist intersectional understandings of diversity. So through um, the last uh, nine years in particular of a participatory action research, two in particular, one, on uh, the Japan Women's Network for Disaster Risk Reduction, working for law reform at the national level here in Japan, as well as tracking young women's leadership in post-disaster Tohoku communities trying to rebuild uh, in the remote communities that were devastated. These two participatory action research um, combined and sort of worked in dialogue with uh, my thinking on feminist political theory and on diversity to reveal a variety of gaps. Gaps in public policy, gaps in how we understand democratic citizenship, and gaps in how we problematize what constitutes uh, disaster risk and disaster risk distribution. So in terms of some of the gaps that we're seeing, uh, and that I think uh, come to be revealed, of course, again with COVID-19 in interesting ways, albeit perhaps with a different iteration, um, is the lack of policy frameworks uh, around intersectional diversity coming to be brought to bear on disaster risk as a core area of study um, within political science, within political theory, um, even within public policy, uh, certainly within Canada um, and other advanced democracies, often disaster risk is not necessarily at the centerfold of what feminist uh, public policy responses are diving into, or even what feminist political theory uh, is tackling as sort of the imperative of a feminist analysis. And I think that was one of the areas where the Japanese women's movement and Japanese activism around disaster risk has been in some ways pushing the dial maybe more sooner in the literatures here, given uh, the impact of natural disasters in Japan frequently, and particularly the mobilizing in Japan of women's movements uh, since the Hanshin Awanji uh, earthquake. Um, but also, we also know from looking at the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction that was adopted in 2015 uh, in Sendai by member states that at the multilateral level, uh, we see that governance, governments worldwide, even if they are member states, are not necessarily collecting reliable disaggregated data that would allow us to do evidence-based responsive policy making that inclu includes an intersectional diversity analysis so that we can have good data on the diversities of the populations and how to develop public policies that are responsive in the post-disaster context. Um, and then finally, I guess within political theory and political science, how do we re-problematize risk governance from a feminist lens, from feminist ethics? Um, how do we bring that lens to bear on emergency management, on public safety, on how we think about risk calculation and risk distribution across diverse social groups within the population who inevitably bear the risk and the bear the brunt of those, uh, those crises and those risks differently and yet are disproportionately excluded from democratic decision-making institutions from local to national levels. Um, so what we also see uh, in public policy and some of the public policy frameworks is this approach around 
marginalized groups and historically vulnerable groups that then get listed in, for example, the International Agreement on DRR in 2015, Sort of the shopping list of vulnerable, essentialized, they've been essentialized as purely vulnerable group. And, and to that research that I did on the Japan Women's Network here for DRR, their feminist law reform approach was really key in securing the inclusion of language to highlight and empower and ensure greater resources allocated to women's leadership for disaster risk, women's leadership in risk governance, women's leadership um, in the critical roles that women are playing in post-disaster communities and within their households. Um, so these kinds of topics um, I've been putting together and, and thinking through how COVID is maybe different from the way that the core assumptions around natural disasters and emergency management and humanitarian crisis response have played out. And in particular, if we're thinking about uh, COVID-19 as a different phenomenon and how we think about the evolution of our public policies, um, of course, this crisis with a natural disaster, we presume a geographic scope that is limited and contained to a specific event that is an earthquake, a tsunami, a hurricane. We might think about the fact that the crisis or the natural disaster is going to be limited in temporal scope. It's going to have boundaries of when it starts and when it stops. And although the post-disaster recovery phase may be very long and include, we're still in year nine of recovery of the Tohoku area, um, there is sort of a sense of temporal containment, whereas I think COVID doesn't offer that. Um, and then, of course, uh, one of the most dramatic areas where I think we see a difference is when, within the post-disaster uh, context in Tohoku, I mean, our first lifelines, and myself included, living in Sendai for my family, the first lifelines was your social and political capital with your neighbors, with your friendship groups, within the people who are within close proximity to you, you could call upon to support your family and your livelihood and get through and share batteries and resources. Um, the, the denial of physical support and, and reliance on social capital, given the risk of contagion of COVID-19, fundamentally wreaks havoc. And so the geographic, temporal, and sort of social capital elements that impact that COVID-19 brings, in, brings a different logic to how we generally risk, uh, do risk governance for natural disasters uh, of this kind. So these, brings, these bring out different risks and exacerbate, of course, um, the areas across gender and diversity. Um, of course, if we don't have good, robust decision-making that's inclusive during peace times, we will not have the kinds of responsive policy supports we need for crisis times. Um, here in Japan, of course, this is leading to an, ex an extreme privatization of all caregiving for children, elderly, adults with disabilities onto the backs disproportionately of women in Japan. Um, the privatization of responsibilities of homeschooling for children uh, contained within very small tight quarters in homes if they are in urban centers of Japan. Um, men who disproportionately hold the permanent protected job contracts at companies um, being expected to still commute and go into work until very recently with the, with the large scale state of emergency. Um, but again, resulting in this increased risk for the men having to commute, um, albeit having the jobs protected, and then women's jobs uh, being increasingly uh, precarious and sacrificed in order for the uh, school closures to be functional um, and be respected. So we're seeing uh, a variety of other uh, demographics uh, being affected, migrant workers in Japan who are losing their jobs, unable to keep working, but cannot afford to go home, frankly. Uh, we see the inability of same-sex you know, same couples who are not legally recognized in Japan to find out information about family members if they do need hospitalization. They're not allowed access to information um, because they're not recognized as families. So precarity that is exacerbated in the ways that we saw in 2011, that those lessons around the gaps of intersectional diversity that haven't been mainstreamed into natural disaster public policy responses and risk governance also now rearing their heads, even in a COVID-19 situation, and even perhaps more heavily. Um, and of course, I think from a democratic perspective, the decisions that we're seeing come down from on high with little transparency as to the rationale, little, little uh, involvement uh, and consultation of core groups that are affected, uh, little gender analysis or diversity analysis, and, uh, and a lack of power sharing across community groups to ensure that risk distribution is ethical um, and is managed in a way that is not simply exacerbating onto the backs of those who are the most uh, vulnerable. Um, and what we'll see finally, is that in this absence of this robust, inclusive democratic decision-making, 
uh, and, and coupled with intersectional policy making during peace times, we're left without the necessary responses uh, during these times of crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. I think that the, you know, an overarching point that we have to make is that we can't have a better politics in a time of crisis than you have in quote unquote normal times. But I think the other point is also, of course, that the times of crisis are normal and that the emergency triggers are just part of the armamentarian of government that we need to be able to theorize as well as to come to terms with. So that concludes our first panel. Thank you very much. We've managed to go over not too, too terribly. Um, and I'd like to just uh, let everybody stretch at their desks for one minute. And then we'll come back to our second panel on the socioeconomic impact. So just one moment of breathing deeply and then we'll go on to the second uh, panel. Thank you. So is everybody, can we start it? Can we start again? Hello? Hello, I'm here. Okay. So, uh, so thank you very much for the quick switch also on the panels. Thank you again for the first group of panelists who were wonderful. We're going to talk now about the socioeconomic impacts and our first speaker is Hélène Carivier, economist at, of, at OFC. Uh, which she will explain, director of the, and director of the Gender Studies Program at Sciences Po in Paris. Hélène. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to present some thought, very uh, trivial thought, because it's uh, complicated so far to have a, a, a deep analysis of the current situation. But thank you so much. It, it was very interesting for me to listen to uh, the previous presentation. So be, before I start, I would like to introduce very briefly some uh, 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 reflection that I have on the current situation. First, we have seen on some media that uh, the countries in which you have uh, female leaders uh, are the countries that uh, perform better in terms of tackling this crisis. And I would like to kind of shed light on this very old story that women would have had some specific skills to deal with crisis. Obviously, to me, it's very uh, uh, close to essentialism to say this, and it's very dangerous because I think that it's better the opposite that happens, that uh, uh, the causality is the opposite, meaning that in, country, in countries in which you have open institution and less discrimination, so much more space for women to accede to this leadership, then those countries are much more able to deal with those types of crises. But this is something that is very interesting because each time we have a big crisis like this, we always put women uh, uh, as being maybe the solution to those crises. It was the case uh, for the previous crisis in, 2000, in, in 2007 and it's the case again. So I would like to maybe uh, warn us on this uh, uh, element. Uh, then maybe to say that the crisis we face in terms of uh, economics is very different from the one we faced uh, in 2007 because first it's a health crisis and it's not an internal crisis uh, to capitalism, it's, it's an external shock to our economy. And maybe also to say that the so social and economic crisis we are going to face uh, will be a much uh, tough and difficult than the one we face in 2007 that give you maybe the, the idea of the level of uh, increase in poverty, in uh, precarity for a lot of people all around the world. Uh, now I'm going to focus more on uh, European countries or at least on high income and democratic countries. So it's going to be a little bit ethnocentric, but uh, this is the country uh, I know the best. Uh, to kind of share with you some thoughts in terms of what, could, what can we say uh, so far uh, on the gender dimension of this socio and economic crisis. Maybe we can uh, have the next slide. So just to say that it has been said previously, but as we are living in a world in which we have a high level of inequalities, and it's also true in Europe, gender inequalities, social inequalities, 
uh, racial inequalities also. The crisis we face currently uh, has uh, really reinforced those inequalities because the, measure, the measures that have been taken in order to tackle the crisis are gender blind. They do not take into account the types of inequalities of our society, so they really reinforce uh, those inequalities. We can think about the, the, the consequences of the lockdown, for instance, in terms of uh, low, uh, children with low social background. It's much more complicated for them uh, to get uh, access to uh, education. Uh, so we can see that those types of measure uh, will uh, really strengthen the types of inequalities we have in our society. So uh, it's maybe because we didn't take enough into account the, the level of inequality before the crisis that then the crisis really shed light on this. So there are many, many dimension, uh, uh, gender dimension of the crisis, but I'm going to focus on the first one, the labor force, and maybe the family issue. So uh, I will not talk about women's rights. It have ob already uh, said previously, uh, a lot can be said about, uh, around poverty, migration, precarity, and also again in terms of education, gender, and, and socioeconomic uh, inequalities uh, uh, related to this. So I'm going to focus on the labor mar market consequences. Just to say very briefly that we know that in whole countries we have a high level of segregation in the labor market and a gender segregation. So it has been said also women are overrepresented in sectors like the health sector and the care sector. So they are further they are in the front line of the crisis because they are really uh, in contact with the virus. So it's much more dangerous for them. But there are also those who are staying employed. Uh, and most people have uh, lost their uh, job. Uh, depending very much on the countries, you have uh, protection for these uh, jobless people. Uh, it's the case in Europe, but it's not the case in the US, for instance. So you will have an increase of, uh, of uh, poverty and, uh, and unemployment, and then it's gonna be highly gendered due to this uh, segregation uh, in the labor market. Um, uh, so, um, it's, it's, it will take time to, to, to have the, 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 the precise data to analyze what's going to happen in terms of gender, uh, because you might have, a, 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 again, a, a people and male workers that might be uh, much more affected uh, because of this sex segregation. But in the same time, we also know that women might be also uh, affected by this. So the level of protection and the type of protection would be very uh, interesting uh, to see, um, it would be very interesting to see to what extent they, they achieve to tackle gender inequalities. We know from the previous crisis that usually when you have uh, protection like short time working, for instance, or part time unemployment, it's much more favorable for men and less for women because women are overrepresented in sector in which uh, negotiation and trade unions are weaker. So we will have to uh, pay attention to this. Maybe we can, uh, yeah, so you have big differences uh, depending uh, of the countries you are looking at. Um, so again, we have uh, other types of segregation. Uh, for instance, we can think about undocumented workers uh, and workers, especially women who are working uh, within household for care services. Uh, again, in those sectors, we know that protection are uh, less as good as it is in uh, manufacturing, for instance. So we know that we will have to, to see what's gonna happen for those female workers. Uh, another uh, point is the consequences of school and chair closures. Uh, because those closures, of course, prevent people from, work, from working and a lot of women are working in this sector. So you might have also uh, uh, differences uh, in terms of what's going to happen for female and male employment. Uh, so I jump to inequalities within family. Um, we know that uh, in all countries, women, women, women perform most of the family and, and educational work. Uh, and so what's going to happen within a couple and how they are going to, to, to manage to rearrange uh, those tasks during the lockdown uh, period, uh, it's probably uh, women who are going to take care of children and their education, and maybe they will have to put uh, uh, their career aside to do so. Uh, so it's 
generally true from home production. So we, this crisis and this lockdown period might enhance the sexual division of labor uh, within couple. We will see this, we will need data to kind of document this uh, hypothesis, but uh, uh, this is something that we can uh, expect. But in the other hand, uh, maybe the fact that, as we said, women are um, really overrepresented in the health sector, uh, you might have a, a, another, um, uh, another uh, impact that may be the opposite in the sense that if men are stuck in the home, maybe they will have to take care of children because they, they, their partner uh, have to uh, still work and, and if they are employed, for instance, in the care or health sector, so maybe, you might expect something positive in terms of gender norms, even though this is something that was expected from the previous crisis already. And it's not clear uh, through the data that we have observed uh, such a shock uh, in terms of sexual division of labor uh, within couple due to this um, obligation of men to stay at home and uh, of women to, to, to work. So we will see this. Then I would like to uh, finish, even though it has been said previously, on the level of uh, violence and abuse within uh, a couple. Uh, and so we know that, and it's already uh, uh, visible in, in data that we have observed an increase of uh, violence within families. In France, for instance, it's more than 30% of, in, of increase of this uh, violence. So uh, because for, for, for different reasons, we know that uh, they are, they are uh, uh, stuck with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, those um, uh, perpetrators within the family, but uh, to me it also echoes to the fact that we should pay more attention to these types of violence before the crisis so that we, we do not put women in such situation. And we know that, for instance, in France, uh, the, the, the public policies to tackle this violence are very low and not enough, obviously, uh, and so we should really uh, emphasize uh, on this uh, public uh, policies so that we could tackle this types of violence and, and maybe change this uh, general uh, systemic violence and, and cultural uh, gender-based violence in our society. So I'm going to stop with this. Uh, I'm sorry, it's very trivial, but I hope we can share ideas around this. No, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Elaine, I wouldn't at all say that it was very trivial. I think that you gave us lots of points of, for further research that are extremely important and that I hope we will all be able to discuss how to work together on. So thank you. Our next speaker is Christina Ewig, from, uh, Professor and Faculty Director of the Center on Women, Gender, and Public Policy at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. Christina, please. Thank you. Um, thanks, Yasmin, and your team for uh, bringing us together. So far, this has been a really stimulating uh, webinar and excited to see so many people that are engaged in the comments as well. So in the six minutes that I have, I'm going to focus on the United States and economics, um, the economics of COVID-19 and its effects on gender. Uh, I think that um, we've raised a number of different ways in which this is uh, a gendered crisis, beginning with the masculinity um, that relates to the numbers of deaths, to um, the healthcare workers that are principally women on the front lines, um, care work, uh, violence against women, uh, special issues of trans individuals. I'm just going to focus in on the job structure in the United States. Uh, and I think some of these some of these elements were already reviewed by Helene, so I will go into greater depth on the U.S., but some of these issues, I think we can, we can think about the ways in which uh, the job market is structured internationally um, in different countries in a comparative perspective, but always uh, with women tending to be um, clustered uh, in particular kinds of occupations that are usually the ones that are paid less and we're learning in the United States are being more vulnerable to the job losses that we're seeing today. Um, so if we could advance the slide, because I'm not sure how to get it to advance. There we go. Oops, let's go back one. There we go. Oh, I, 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 I can control it. Okay, so when we think about the U.S. labor market, um, there's a significant degree of occupational clustering by gender. 
um, with one of the major sectors that's important for COVID-19 uh, being the service sector. The service sector, of course, includes um, healthcare services, uh, in which, as Helene mentioned, um, we should see uh, more maintenance of jobs in that sector. That's not actually the case in the United States. Um, but yes, we do have uh, principally women on the front lines of providing healthcare services, um, but we also see job losses in that area. Um, but we also see women uh, concentrated in other parts of the service sector, uh, food preparation in particular, that has had a dramatic impact with restaurant closures um, and personal care. So thinking of how many people will like haircuts these days, but are not provided um, because uh, uh, salons, for example, have been closed. So um, other parts of the service sector, uh, we do see men, but it's, there, there's a big difference. About one in five women in the U.S. work in the service sector compared to one in 10 men. Um, and a lot of these areas are impacted by the pandemic. It's important to also bring in the U.S. context um, to bear an intersectional perspective, in, especially when it comes to race in relationship to the job market. So in that service sector, it becomes more concentrated um, of women, at, women of color. So Latinas, we see one in three work in the service sector. They tend to be more in that food preparation area. Uh, and one in four African-American and Native American women working in the service sector where we see a greater concentration actually in, in healthcare um, services, home health aides in particular. People that are on the front lines, for example, in nursing homes, which in the United States um, are really the, the center of, of the pandemic in terms of the greatest numbers of deaths and so high degree of risk. Um, in the US, because of the kind of weak uh, welfare states that we have um, in contrast to European countries, uh, this sector is among the lowest paid, but also the fewest benefits. Um, oftentimes workers are not given full-time jobs and then not eligible for health insurance. Um, sick leave is often not uh, also one of the standard benefits in this, in this sector. Uh, and it is also one of the areas where we see some of the highest uh, job losses, at least in the first wave. And so what I'm gonna show you next is, um, a, well, in two slides, a, uh, a graph of where these job losses have, have happened. But the latest reports for job losses in the U.S. came out yesterday, um, showing that 22 million U.S. residents have filed for unemployment um, benefits in the last month. Uh, what I have in the next slide is what we see in those first two weeks. We don't have numbers yet that bring us through um, through a longer period of time. Uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the US takes more time to show us the disaggregated data of where those, those losses are coming from. Um, but this is uh, an analysis put together by the Institute for Women, um, uh, WPR, uh, IWPR in uh, Washington, DC, that shows in the first two weeks of the pandemic where most of these losses were according to when divided by men and women. Um, and if you look right at the bottom, you see the major losses being in leisure and hospitality. So this is your restaurants and your hotels um, that were immediately closed. Um, you also see that negative line. So the red is women and the gray is men. Uh, you see an, a very negative line in educational and health services. Um, this is to be expected from education areas, and this is for women in particular, where we see the negative line. Um, when you look at some of these statistics uh, more carefully and disaggregated, what's interesting is that we do see losses in the healthcare sector um, at, in those unemployment claims, because at least in the United States, any kind of unessential healthcare um, has been closed and only essential healthcare services are running. So uh, those women that work in unessential areas, uh, for example, dental hygienists. Most dental offices are closed in the US and dental hygienists are 95% uh, women in the US. Uh, so those, uh, those people are filing for unemployment in that sector. Uh, I also find interesting in these, in these statistics that retail trade, of course, retail trade has been highly impacted with stores closed other than online. Um, 
that sector tends to be fairly even in the US between women and men in terms of the percentage that work in it, but we're seeing greater layoffs or, uh, of women within this sector. So I think there's research to be done as we think about research in this area to understand exactly where within these particular sectors we're seeing um, who is being laid off and how that breaks down between, uh, between women and men in particular. Uh, of course, when we look at these, uh, these areas, what in the US has not been, what has been considered essential has been healthcare, but also areas like construction where uh, we haven't seen closures. And in fact, you can see a bit of growth for men in jobs in the first two weeks. Um, and financial activities, banks have been, have been open and there we see a bit of growth in terms of job roles. Uh, so there's a mixed, um, a mixed picture here. This is only the first two weeks. I think when we see these, these numbers will come out again May 8th, uh, and we can do a greater analysis of a longer period of time, where as the pandemic continues, we will probably see some evening out. We've already seen some evening out of employment claims, um, though it still is today at about 55% women um, uh, making up all of those unemployment claims, whereas the first week we saw closer to the range of 65% women. So we may see some changes in evening out over time. I'd like to finish by saying that there are some long-term elements here of the crisis. Uh, because women are earning, um, we have a significant gender wage gap that increases uh, depending upon uh, um, one's race in, in the United States. Uh, this means that and the service sector happens to be among the lower wage areas. This means that there's less capacity for savings uh, in order to withstand the crisis that we have right now, um, and less to invest uh, in home ownership and child's education, things that one uh, needs to invest in in order to, exp in to, to reduce the wealth gap that we see overall in the, in, in the US and of which women are more subject to having um, lower wealth, particularly women of color. So uh, my time is up, and I'll and I'll I'll leave it there. Our next speaker is Paula Herrera Idarraga, uh, professor, assistant professor of economics at the, and I'm going to mispronounce this, Pontifica Universidad Javeriana of Bogota. So Paula, please. Hey, thank you very much for this invitation. I'm so glad to be on this panel. And in Elena, Christina, and Marcella have gave a really good introduction for what I'm going to present. So I'm going to go quickly into some of the aspects. I'm just going to focus on the Colombian context. So I guess that it's already clear why gender matters in this uh, current crisis, why we should take care about this uh, kind of uh, analysis and 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 to be really brief, it's because we know that there are these huge disadvantages that women face and the current, current crisis will just widen, and widen them up. And I'm going to focus about the employment analysis as Christina has done for the US. I'm going to do that for Colombia. And the, the thing about Colombia is that there have been some speculations because right now we don't have any data from the a statistics department that can tell us what is going on with employment. We don't know that for sure. And as you may know, in Colombia, we have a, a high share of informal workers, meaning workers that we cannot track. So let's go for some key facts about the Colombian context. We know as for other countries that women are, um, on the, are, are the majority of health and care workers. They uh, are about 73% of the sector, and as has already been said, they faced a high risk of uh, getting the, the virus, so this should be taken care of by the government. And second, and most importantly for the Colombian context, women are have a really high uh, unemployment rate, I'm going to go with that in a minute. But what is really interesting about the Colombian co context before the the COVID uh, crisis started was that men employment was rising. We we saw in the last um, data that we had for February that uh, there were a creation of male jobs, 178,000, while uh, women jobs were destroying. So we had a decrease in women employment uh, for 
233,000. We know also, as uh, Marcella was saying, as in the Italian context, that women in Colombia carry a, a high burden in terms of unpaid work. And, and I'm going to go into those statistics in, in a while. And then we know that women are disproportionately likely to work in sectors that have been hit hardest by the lockdown. And we know that these sectors are mostly low paid and they are in secure employment in terms of, um, they, they don't pay any contributions in terms of health and pension systems. And we know that as in other countries that women are the majority of people living in poverty and female head, head, headed households are more likely to be poor. So let's go for some statistics so to, you get to know more uh, close the Colombian context. So I have put here the statistics for 2019. You can find the participation rate, the unemployment rate and the employment. So what I'm meaning about this gap, as you see, is that women are in this disadvantage in all of these uh, econo labor economic uh, outcomes. So they have really low participation rate, really high unemployment rate and really low employment rate. And you can see in the graph that this rate, they have moved a, moved a bit in the last 10 years, but not too much. So these gaps have been really persistent over time. And in the graph, uh, you can see the, I'm sorry, uh, because of the Spanish, <laughs> I didn't have time to translate everything, but you can see on the graph, the number of hours that women devote to, um, to uh, pay activities, which are 735 hours, compared to men, which is nine hours. And you can see also the hours that women devote to unpaid work, which are seven hours compared to just three hours for men. So this is the huge gap that we also face in unpaid work. So uh, this has been the analysis that uh, other universities have done so far in terms of how many jobs are at risk right now because of the COVID crisis. So this is an analysis that was done by Marcela Slava at Los Andes. And as you can see, Marcela uh, forecast is that in Colombia, there are around 9 million um, uh, jobs that are at risk right now. But there's no uh, gender analysis in this, in this kind of uh, exercise. So what we are doing right now with, and you have them by sector. So again, I'm sorry because it's not in English, but I hope that you can understand some of these uh, Spanish words. So uh, as you can see, we have done the same analysis, but differentiating men and women. So if we take out construction, which is the highest uh, bar that you see there on orange, you, you have men and on blue, you have women. So if you take out construction, which is one of the sectors that is going to, according to the analysis that uh, Marcela Slava is doing, is, one, is going to be one of the sectors that are going to be really hit by the, by the crisis. In the other sectors, in the most important ones, which is commerce, and as uh, Christina was saying, hotels and restaurants, you can see that women are disproportionately higher affected by this crisis than, than, than men. This is, of course, not, we, we don't have any data of what happened with employment in March, so we cannot go through this data as Christina was uh, showing us, which was great because we saw how uh, so men were having more jobs and women were having less jobs. But as you can see in the, in the two bars, we have the number of women or men that mostly are going to be affected by the crisis. And though men are going to be more affected in, in, in number, we, we are going to see that the crisis at the end is going to end up with less women uh, employed than men. And this is the, the next slide that I have here. So what is at risk? So if you could go to the next slide. Okay, here. Thank you. What is at risk is that we know that the, uh, the employment pre-COVID, we have 30 million of men employed and we had 9 million of women employed. That meant that for the whole population employed, women were the 41% of that population. And if we are going to, if we are going to, to, 
to, to have these effects on employment. And as I said, this is, the, we, we are, do, we are assuming the same thing as Marcela Slava and, and Los Andes are doing for the whole populations. We're going to end up just with 36% of women as part of the whole employed population. And this is a huge uh, disadvantage for women. And this is going back to, uh, we, we don't have really good uh, serious data for employment because in Colombia we did a lot of changes of um, household survey, so it's really difficult to compare. But this is going really back in time where women, they didn't participate as much in the, in the labor market. So just to conclude and to be brief, uh, the recommendations and lines for future research that we are putting out in this, in this presentation is that government should take care about this sex desegregated data to best understand and act so gender gaps are not widened even further in the future. And for future research, what we are doing is that we know that there are a lot of women who are head of households in Colombia with children, and they should be treated differently from the rest of populations because they, are, they don't have anything, uh, anyone to, with, uh, they can count on. And we also know that there, are, there were a lot of unemployed women before the crisis. And the government is only putting attention on those people who are losing their jobs, but they are not saying anything about those people who had already lost their job and who are now completely without any option of getting a new job. So that's, I, I hope. Okay. Paula, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm very pleased also to see your directions for research now. I really would ask everybody to please stay for Sonia. I'm so sorry that, we're over, that we are so late. Um, it's predictable, but it's also very unfortunate. But Sonia, please. Okay, great. I'm just trying thank to find. Here we go. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much uh, to all of the speakers uh, ahead of me. I'm going to be able to speed through some of what I was going to speak about because you've done such a great job of, of highlighting, I think, some of the, the key points that I wanted to raise, especially vis-a-vis -vis the labor market. Um, what I do want to talk about, though, um, is uh, talk about what this crisis means um, in terms of not just the gender perspectives, but also thinking about the overall uh, econom economic development um, uh, consequences of the pandemic. And so what I want to talk about a little bit, and, um, you know, certainly we've heard from, from Colombia, we've heard from, um, uh, we've heard from Kenya, we've heard from, uh, from uh, Kazakhstan about different experiences. Um, but I think that we do need to sort of think about the notion that whatever is happening, this is a global issue, but really the way this is going to manifest itself is going to play itself out quite differently um, in, in middle and low income countries. Uh, so I want to talk briefly about what this means for the economic development uh, in those in those sessions, in, in those in those sectors, uh, but also talk about the special challenges uh, and opportunities also for developing countries or low and middle income countries. Um, so if I can uh, just sort of uh, start by saying that essentially what we're dealing with here is we're dealing with three major crises, right? The first crisis is, of course, a health crisis, which is affecting morbidity and mortality uh, around the world. And it probably hasn't quite hit uh, what it's going to look like in many uh, developing countries. So I think we're still waiting to see how the epidemic is going to uh, play itself out there. Second, there's also the uh, very strong uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions such as the lockdowns, which are going to have an impact on the economy as well. And we're already seeing that. And certainly, um, you know, the data that was just presented for the U.S. and for uh, Colombia is showing already the huge impact that just a couple of weeks of this has had. And then third, um, there is also this broader macroeconomic crisis, which comes from a contraction of aggregate demand, whether it's because people's in disposable incomes are falling or because people are uh, not going out to, uh, to consume in the way that they used to, and just simply a reduction in, um, in consumer uh, confidence and consumer spending. And so I think um, the big issue is how this is going to play itself out in terms of gender issues. Um, I think also, uh, like for the rest of the economy, it's going to depend on the severity, the depth of the recession. Uh, is it going to be V-shaped? Is it going to come back online quickly? Uh, if not, and certainly it's increasingly looking unlikely that that's going to happen, um, especially for middle 
particularly low-income countries where we're not even seeing the start of the pandemic yet. Um, this could be, um, and certainly according to the IMS recent outlook, um, looking that we're not going to see a full recovery uh, or even a close recovery until sometime in 2021. And so I think this has very strong implications for uh, long-term living standards. And in particular, as we've heard uh, quite a few times um, today, uh, the fact that women very often are disproportionately represented among the, uh, the most disadvantaged uh, segments of, uh, of, of, of economies around the world. And so what are we concerned about here? Uh, well, not only are we concerned about, um, you know, the, both the health, but also the economic uh, suffering of populations around the world, um, but there's also this notion that um, people who are currently poor or vulnerable um, might actually see um, this shock uh, coming quite uh, quite down. And so with it, what I mean by that is that where we've seen, um, you know, tremendous progression uh, towards the uh, meeting some of the sustainable development goals in terms of reductions in poverty, uh, reductions in the gender gaps and in income and education and so on, the concern is that the longer that this global recession is going to drag, uh, the more we're going to see some losses in those gains. And the question is whether or not those uh, losses can be recovered quickly. Um, so these are, uh, I think, some very serious uh, uh, considerations. I think we're, we need to see how it's going to play itself out. Um, but of course, we know that these impacts, and we've heard about this already uh, quite a bit today, uh, the, the main impact that this is having, or the, probably one of the biggest and, and most attention uh, grabbing impact that it's having around the world, especially for women, is in terms of labor impact livelihoods and also balancing work and care and so I won't talk too too much about that uh, except for maybe highlighting some of the issues that we might want to think about with specific reference to to development um, the other thing I think we need to talk about is also the long-term impacts on human capital accumulation um, uh, marriage, fertility, and intimate partner violence uh, has been touched on, uh, and of course, poverty and vulnerability are, are key, um, you know, variables that we're going to have to uh, look at as the pandemic uh, makes its way through through the world. Okay, so um, so I really want to break up, um, you know, the the impact of labor uh, of the crisis on labor, uh, thinking separately, supply and demand. Now, I won't go through all of this because a lot of these points have already been raised. Um, so maybe you know, if you can sort of um, look at the, the the map here that's at the top right, um, what makes a lot of developing low and middle income countries quite unique compared to the experience in North America or uh, in the European Union is that a lot of labor. Um, and I think my the previous speaker um, had highlighted this in, in Colombia a, a lot of labor and in particular women's work is informal and so what does this mean this means on the one hand a lot of job insecurity this means no benefits no sick leave it's very precarious it's you know hand-to-mouth day-to-day and so the way we think about um, however we're going to address um, you know uh, all of the problems around job losses in a developing country where there's a lot of informal work is going to look very different than what it might look like um, in, in, say, Canada, the United States, or, 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 or Europe. Um, specific vulnerabilities, we've already talked about that, but you know, a lot of these informal types of jobs that women um, do in developing countries are very much public facing jobs. So you know, these are not jobs that can be work done at home. These are jobs uh, where it's real interacting with the public, it's you know, uh, hairdressing, it's uh, selling at the kiosk, it's selling food, work, and, and that sort of thing. So, so here there's gonna be a strong <clears throat> impact um, that I think we really do need to see how the informal sector is going to be able to adjust to these sort of lockdown measures, right? So all of these labor supply things is really coming from the lockdown. Something that I think is really important to think about is we don't just need to think about the labor impacts now. I think we are, um, my big concern, of course, is that this might actually have a very long-term impact on, on labor force, especially for girls, uh, because of the shock to education, right? A lot of adolescent girls uh, right now might actually not go back to school once the schools come back online, right? And so the question is, what is this going to mean for their long-term uh, labor market prospects? Uh, we're already seeing from a previous um, pandemic in the 2014 uh, West Africa Ebola crisis, um, some work by uh, Bandera et al, um, that, um, that we've seen some severe um, 
uh, or, or quite a few uh, increases in teenage um, uh, adolescent fer uh, fertility, and this, of course, is going to have long-term impacts. You see, I'm running out of time. Um, so let me just also uh, just quickly touch on the labor demand. Um, I think there's also, um, you know, this, well, I think the, that top part has already been, been addressed. Um, but, you know, I think the other thing to think about is just the long-term impacts. Um, so here's a story from, of course, the garment industry, which hires a lot of women. So uh, in, in Bangladesh and um, a lot of advances that we've seen in uh, gender, um, you know, improving the gender gap uh, in, in Bangladesh in terms of income. Um, so these are all jobs. The question is, is, are those jobs going to come back online, right? So are these factories going to be able to, to, to survive the economic crisis? Um, Okay, I'm out of time. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, just maybe, um, yeah, I'll just leave it there. And if anybody wanted to, um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Sonia, I'm so sorry. Maybe you had a few, a couple more sentences you wanted to say to draw your conclusions. Uh, well, yeah, no, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I think we, we, we will need to sort of rethink. Um, no, I, you know what, I, I won't have time. So I'll just leave it there. We're already. Okay, I think that, okay. So I'm sorry about that, and I'm sorry that our time became so compressed, but I think that all in all, we've gone in, first of all, it's been extremely informative, and I really want to thank everybody who, um, who spoke, because you all spoke in very difficult circumstances, so putting together your presentations in very little time, and also delivering them in even less time, so thank you so much for that, but it did give us a sort of general overview, which I think is incredibly valuable. And I think it also, um, especially when we go back over the, the, the recording and think back on the presentations and so on, will allow us to see where new research actually is being done, needs to be done, and how, what the connections could be between the different kinds of research, the different research agendas that are um, being, that, that have been mentioned today and also uh, connect in a way the dots between the, what's happening at an economic level and what's happening at a political, social mobilizational level. Ask the question, are there any connections, which there may or may not be, and can we learn by putting those two uh, spheres together? I also think that some of the really crucial questions uh, from a practical point of view have to do with how to address the long the long term impacts of the losses that we are now seeing in the gains that had been made, and whether we have to think about these as setbacks that are for the long how long for whether they are setbacks that we can try to address by just simply remobilizing the kinds of tools that uh, and strategies that initially led to those gains, or how we have to rethink the gains themselves. I think for all of us who teach public policy um, and sort of global affairs in you know, any one of our very many disciplines, this is a question also of theories, of frameworks, and of course of data, and of keeping up the conversation. So I really want to thank everybody. I'm in awe of the fact that so many people have continued to stay on, even though and I take the full responsibility for this. We did run it over time. I apologize to, again for people who, whose time was compressed, but I thank you and I hope that we've all been able to um, get a lot out of it. I do want to say also that the chats have been extremely active um, and that one of the wonderful things is to have seen chats among people in the, um, in the webinar but that we will also respond to all of the chats in particular requests for PowerPoints and so on. So thank you all again very, very much for coming. I'm hopeful that we will have more and uh, sort of calm, less pressured discussions in the very near future and that we'll be able to work again soon. Thank you.